Um, welcome to the RSA. Um, I'm Rachel O'Brien. Um, I lead the RSA's work on prisons. Um, some thank yous first. Thank you first to you for coming out along and those joining us remotely because the event would be is, is being live streamed. Uh, the hashtag for this event is RSA Justice. If you want to tweet during the event, please do, but just can you make sure your phone is on silent? And thanks also to the RSA, its fellows, and the amazing team responsible for RSA's platforms. And most evenings of the week, these kinds of events are happening. And I'm sure you'll all join me um, in thanking Niels Oberg. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm saying that right. And his colleague, Martin Hoag, for being here today. Before I hand over to Niels, I've been asked to say something about um, the context for prison reform and the wider justice agenda in England and Wales. For the title of this event, I posed the question of whether prison reform in England and Wales was at a crossroads. In doing so, I implied a simplicity of choice and a kind of speed of travel that now I'm going to take to task, so I'm slightly contradicting myself here. There is a risk at, that the current problems facing our prison, uh, prisons lead us down a road where we and the public believe that talk of wider institutional reform is a pipe dream. Hardly a week and sometimes a day goes past without a reminder of the severe pressures <coughs> facing our prisons. The rise in suicide, self-harm, assaults and disturbances making too many of our prisons and too many of our people unsafe. And as the headlines hit, there are those that believe that the only solution is to reduce the prison population and or increase investment. There are others who hear about the prevalence of new psychoactive substances, often called spice, um, in, in prisons and the dramatic and dangerous effects this is having and conclude that the only solution is that we need to stop drugs coming into prisons. And others, again, perhaps not in this room, see the lack of control in some of our prisons and decide that the only solution is tougher regimes, more punishment and recruitment of a more authoritative workforce. And others simply feel nothing or turn away. Leaving the face of those inside out of mind, if no longer out of sight. So aside from the defeatism, the last three propositions um, have some merit and have their own internal logic. The prison population is too high. Too many of our prisons are overcrowded and there are people inside who should not be. I'm sure we all love to see more investment, not just in prisons, but also in those services that prevent people to come into prison in the first place and work with them when they leave. And yes, new psychoactive substances are a game changer. If I was in prison without purpose, locked up in for most of the day, or scared, or all of those things, I'm not sure I would not also seek out a mind-altering substance with all the risks that that brings. So yes, we do need to tackle drug supply, but we must also reduce demand. Well, those who call for harsher regimes could do well to spend some time with the staff and prisoners there. Uh, we, we do need staff who have authority. I agree with that. But we need to look at what evidence and what works of gaining that. What does authority mean? And as any good governor or prison officer will tell you, prisons are largely run by consent. Authority comes through building strong relationships, through mutual respect, higher levels of trust, and by giving staff, sorry, by giving people, staff and prisoners, crucially, a higher sense of purpose. So the crossroads is not binary or choice between two directions, the, sh the short versus the long term, numbers versus culture. We need to go both ways at the same time. Reform is not just about officer numbers or pay. The government's additional investment in frontline staff and some movement on pay is a welcome recognition of the impact that the rising prison population and the reduction in funding since 2010 has had. But this has not removed the huge challenges facing many prisons in terms of recruitment and keeping people. Reform is also about what training and development is available throughout people's careers, about whether we empower, equip, and trust staff to make wise judgments, implement their ideas, and motivate them. For me, it is also about enabling officers and prisons to do more of the work that people like me and some of you might do. 
we want culture change in prisons, we need to enable prisons staff and prisoners to home grow more of their own solutions, assess impact and get more out of the huge amounts of money spent in this area, whether that's public or private or philanthropic. Reform is not just about the number of prisoners, although high populations and large institutions make change much, much more difficult. We also need institutional reform within prisons in their relationship to the range of agencies involved across the whole justice journey from judiciary, probation, to the third sector, employers and community. That's why I actually think the Prison and Courts Bill published last month and the structural changes made to the, to the prison service provide opportunities for progress. Last October, the RSA completed the first stage of its prison project, future prison project that sought to shape what that progress might look like. And I'd like to take this opportunity, because some people are in the room, to thank those that that work with us, and that included uh, former prisoners, uh, staff, governors, but also our, our advisory board, our chair, John Podmore, who's here somebody, somewhere, um, and, and most particularly our funders, James Tinson, Lady Edwina Grosvenor, and Hugh Lennon, who funded the work. Wouldn't have been possible without you. Together we set out a blueprint for a community-based rehabilitative prison, a framework for policy that would support such, mod such models. This included recommendations that are reflected to some extent in, in the new bill, uh, including recreating a duty uh, to rehabilitate that sits right at the top of, of, of the Ministry of Justice and we hope will flow through the system, strengthening the inspection regime and giving governors greater freedoms and greater accountability. The bill does not provide for the devolved model we argued for. It does give governors more control about, over how they recruit, how they use their budgets, and, and commissioning for education, health and employment will now be, be, be done more locally. And the bill does not reflect, importantly, much of the wider agenda, including the government's agenda, of the critical importance of engaging the wider community, of engaging employers in, in, this, in the business of rehabilitation. Um, employers are critical to this in, in, play, in boosting skills and opportunities for those both inside and when they leave. <coughs> All this implies new opportunities and challenges, including the striking the right balance between governors' freedoms and accountability. And for me, it poses a big question about how the new framework sits with the probation service, which we'll talk about more later, uh, which at the moment there's more, more evidence emerging that some areas are struggling to meet people's needs. So, <laughs> you're right. Prison is only part of the journey, and, and I think it would be grossly unfair if governors are to be held to account for gaps in the system elsewhere or for lack of local integration. These changes amplify, sorry, these changes imply significant um, changes to what we're asking from our prison leaders, from staff, and from prisons themselves. Uh, the engagement in prisons, in my book, is absolutely critical to this reform agenda. And this is where Nils comes in. Many of you working in the justice sector look to his country as a beacon of light. But we're always told, or I'm always told, when I mention Sweden, ah, oh, but we're not Sweden. We have a much larger population and a much larger prison population. We're much more diverse. We have higher levels of inequality, which correlate strongly with high prison populations. But as we stand at the crossroads and try to tackle both the immediate pressures I've talked about and that longer-term institutional reform, we might need a new map and we might need some new directions. And I can't think of a better place to start than ask Nils some advice. Nils has had a distinguished, a distinguished career having held a number of senior roles at the Swedish Ministry of Justice, most recently as a Director General for Administrative Affairs. I know he's just also been asked to lead some work on looking at interventions around uh, domestic violence and violence of children. Um, please, I want you to join me in welcoming Nils to the stage. Thank you very much, Rachel, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here 
Um, thank you for coming. I'm so impressed that so many of you have joined on a Wednesday evening to talk about these issues. Uh, and picking up on something you said, Rachel, about dismissing um, this very small country up in the north. I'm a, you know, I, I usually watch these BBC-produced programs on, on human development. I love those shows. Um, but they all seem to come up with the conclusion that any condition for any form of human life stops somewhere in the northern part of Germany. So anytime somebody like you calls and invites us, you know, I'm thrilled <laughs> that, that, uh, because it's a confirmation we actually do exist. Um, I understand that there's a lively discussion in this country on criminal justice reforms and issues, uh, and that some important reforms are underway. Uh, and let me therefore begin just by saying, and also you made the reference on, on, on making or seeking advice, I don't give advice uh, in, in, in this area. I think my experience is that whatever you do in the, in the justice sector, the, the constituencies that, that are, are so different and the legal context are really, and the history is so different, that it's very, very difficult, I think, to, to transpose any solutions from one jurisdiction to the next. But having said that, uh, I think looking around now what is going on in, in various parts of the world, in, in our sector, you know, there are some very interesting things happening, um, and also some things that we can all learn from. Uh, I certainly do uh, when I travel and meet colleagues from, from various parts of uh, of the world, and, and I'll just give you a few examples. I've spent quite a lot of time in recent years in the US, uh, and I must say that there are some extremely courageous colleagues uh, who are you know, questioning quite vocally um, the way the system operates in the United States. Uh, and they've also, I think, in, in, in a very courageous way, put their fingers at some dysfunctions of, of how people are treated in, in, when incarcerated in, 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 the, in the US system. And one of the things that they've challenged is what they call administrative seg segregation, that so many people in the US spend time isolated. Well, we have that problem, uh, not in prisons, but in remand prisons and in, in, in pretrial detention centers in my country. So, I mean, they are, as you said, a beacon of light uh, in terms of also uh, highlighting some of the effects of incarceration on, 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 on some very vulnerable people. Um, I think another development that is worth mentioning is what's going on in many of the African countries. Um, what, I, what I see there is you know, a very clear trend where the business is handed over from military and police structures to what is becoming a, profess a profession in, in its own right. Uh, and that is, you know, that is a very important conclusion uh, of, of you know, what is going to be the, the foundation of, uh, of developing also prison and probation on, on that continent. I think in Europe we've seen a development in, in recent years where some countries have introduced non-custodial sentences uh, in, in recent year. And I know that when I spoke to my colleagues only four, four or five years ago, that was politically absolutely unthinkable. Uh, so there are things happening, I think, all over the place right now in, in, in this area. Uh, and, and looking a little bit closer about the, the mechanisms of that, I think we can all learn a little bit about how we run our own operations. Now, compared to all of that, I sometimes feel that there's absolutely nothing whatsoever going on back home worth telling about. Uh, but again, when you look a little bit closer on what's going on in my country, there are at least two trends that I thought I would highlight, uh, mention, and perhaps reflect a little bit upon tonight. Uh, and the first one, Yes, I recognize this. The first trend that, that I would like to mention is the decline 
uh, of our prison and probation population. Let's see if this works. And what you see on this chart is uh, there, there are three trends, actually. The, the, the one in the top uh, is the probation uh, clients, and the blue one is prison, and the remand is, is the, uh, I guess, purple one. So what you can see there is that we've had a, a development since, I would say, early 2004 with a declining prison population, quite steady actually, up until 2011, 2012. Uh, and it, perhaps it doesn't really show with this scale, but from 2011 we have a relatively sharp drop of the inflow or the influx of, of inmates in prisons uh, of the magnitude of four to five to six percent per year. And the interesting thing is that when that trend started, we thought, well, in that case, um, we're diverting part of the population from prisons to, to, uh, to probation. But what you can see is that we've had in probation a similar trend since uh, 2007 and an extremely sharp drop that coincides with, with uh, the year 2011-2012. So something has happened in, in our system. Uh, and, and if you add the numbers, we have had a 20 to 25% reduction of our population and caseload uh, over the past few years, which is rather uh, a dramatic change seen from our point of view. And we've never seen a change of this magnitude in modern history. Uh, and the question, of course, for us is why? What, what can possibly explain this development? Um, and the first thought, of course, is that it corresponds to changes in criminality uh, and that we've seen a, a general improvement in, 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 the, in the crime area in general. But that's really not the case. I mean, we see no correlation between these figures and reported crime in the country. What we do see are changes uh, within the criminal patterns. We've had an explosion, for example, that coincides with part of these figures with fraud on the internet. I'm sure you have the same development here, uh, which is, of course, an area which is extremely difficult to prosecute. So that certainly uh, has had uh, an impact. Uh, and the big question, of course, is, is this good news or is, is this bad news? Um, uh, and the good news would be that there indeed would be a correspondence between what's going on in the society. The bad news theory is that you have a number of individuals who should be in our care, but who are still out there and continues to, com to commit crime. That is frequently a criticism that, that we're faced with on the basis of, of these figures. Yes, it's true, we've had a, uh, the caseload in, in, in the justice sector, so from the police to the prosecution and the prosecution to the courts, is significantly lower today than it was in 2008 and 2009. So there probably is an effect uh, of that sort uh, in, in, this, uh, in these figures. And we can see a correspondence to uh, one of the biggest reorganizations that we've had in modern history of our police organization. So I think everybody agrees that yes, there is, a, there is an efficiency issue here, uh, which has an effect on, on, on the caseload that we're faced with. So that, that certainly is um, uh, something to be taken into, a, into account. But what we would like to know, of course, from a man both from a political but also from a managerial point of view, is do we think that this uh, is, a, is a lasting lower level or, or is, it, um, is it going to change again? Well, if the theory about the, about the efficiency in the judiciary is, is uh, true, that would imply that it's going to change uh, because I'm quite convinced that the police organization will increase its efficiency in criminal investigations and in that case we will start pick up, picking up pace again and, and probably relatively uh, soon. But one of the things uh, that we know has happened in, in our country is that we've seen a shift in the way the courts are sentencing for serious drug crimes. 
and it corresponds to a decision by our Supreme Court of 2011. So one of the things that has happened, and this we know for sure, is that the number of prison years issued has shrunk significantly uh, due to the fact that for serious drug crimes we've had a 30 or 40 percent reduction of the number of years that the courts are, are sentencing. So that is a big uh, game changer for us. Uh, and the government uh, incidentally is, is, is uh, introducing a whole range of new um, penal laws where the, um, uh, where the sentencing is going to be uh, much more harsher. So that also over time I think will, will mean that we will not see these kinds of, of, of figures and trends uh, in the future. But I think for us the most important question that, that we've asked ourselves based on these figures is to what extent is this also a reflection on our work? Are we or are we not successfully uh, contributing uh, to, to receiving less of inmates due to the fact that we have such a big emphasis on rehabilitation? Are we contributing to this development or are there, is this the effect of factors that are out of our control? And in order to at least be able to have some kind of answer to that question, and this is the second trend that I wanted to share with you, um, is that we have looked to our statistics when it comes to recidivism. Uh, and we haven't done that actually in a very long time uh, for I think reasons that uh, is that we just assume uh, that there is no impact. You know, we've had, when I, when I came to the service five years ago and I started asking questions about the recidivism rates in, in the country, the answer was, well, it's about, it's about 40% that return, 40% of those who are released from a, from a prison or probation sentence of our service that return within three years. Uh, is that good or is that bad? Well, I think when, when I compare to the figures that, uh, that I can access internationally, it's a relatively good figure, 40% not bad, but the frustrating Part of that was that it was, it, it was a flat line. You know, when you looked back in time for decades, it was the same. It was 40% in, 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 you know, for 20 years, no changes, which of course is extremely frustrating for an organization that invests so heavily in, in preventing relapse of crime. So we, what we did was we asked our experts and statistic, uh, statisticians to dig a little bit deeper into, into the figures uh, and what they came up with, I think it's almost a year now, uh, is what our Minister for Justice recently called the best kept business secret in the, in the justice sector. And that is that, that the, the recidivism rate is, is dropping. And it's dropping um, uh, relatively fast. So the, what, 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 what they came up with in, in terms of numbers was this. We've had a development since the year, what is it, year 2000 approximately, where indeed the recidivism rate was 40% or slightly more than 40%. And it's been dropping by about 1% per year up until the year 2012. Uh, I mean, since it's a three year count, um, you know, these are the, 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 the most recent figures that we can present. So from 40% to 29.3%, uh, which I think by any international standard is extremely low. Uh, and, but that's not the most important part, I think. The most important point is that it continues to drop. So then the question becomes, what, what is this? And, and, and what can possibly explain this development? Is it real or not? Yes, I believe it is. Uh, we, have, we have counted and recounted, and we have asked a number of other institutions to double check the figures. So we're relatively confident that this is, this is for real. It's not an optical effect of anything else. It really is a demonstration of the fact that recidivism is, is dropping. Um, 
And the question is, what explanations can we possibly offer for this development? Um, and to be fair, part of it, we believe, is that we are taking farewell of a generation of inmates and clients that have been with us for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, we had a situation where the, the, young, uh, the young groups that came to our service in, in the early 90s and that were born in the 60s and the 70s with a lot of drug issues, uh, they're, they're now my age uh, and growing tired and much less active. So it, it's clear that we have that aging effect. Uh, but it can't really, when we look at that and we calculate it, it, it really can't explain the whole drop. Part of it, a couple of percent probably, but, but hardly more than that. So what are the other explanations? Uh, well, with the reservation that I'm not going to be able to give you much of scientific backup to what I'm going to say. At least what I can offer is what we think so far when we analyze the, 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 the figures and the reasons behind this development. Um, it has both to do, in my view, of the political and also operational choices that we have made in, in, in our country for a very long time. And the first one that I would like to mention is the, 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 the political setup, if you will, uh, between the government, or the setup of the balance of power between the government and the service. That I think is going to be one, or is one of the most important factors in play, and I'll, I'll develop that in just a minute. The second one, I think has to do with the way the government has defined the tasks of the Swedish Prison and Probation Service. That has been extremely important for us in, in, in setting up the strategies that we have chosen. And the third one has to do with the way we have formulated our operational strategies to produce results and reach the goals that the government has set up. So those three I think factors are the most important ones. And before we get the discussion going, let me just elaborate a little bit on those three points. Now, firstly, the division of labor between my government and the prison and probation service is extremely clear. No individual minister, nor the government as a collective body, can in principle tell us what to do. What the government does is to provide us with multi-annual and annual directions in various forms, setting out what we are expected to achieve. But how we do that is entirely up to us. And in fact, the Constitution prohibits the government of interfering in any area or case uh, which we handle under the law. So there's a very strict uh, separation of power, if you will, uh, between the government's responsibilities of actually telling us where to go and what to achieve uh, and, and our delegated power to actually come up with the solutions to get there. Now, why, why is that so important? Uh, why, why is that constitutional setup uh, so effective? Well, I think for at least one very good reason. This is a policy area uh, and an area of public administration that is a little bit different from many others. Why? Well, because it is ruled often, not always, but often by fear, by prejudice, and by emotions of anger. Uh, and that is true, you know, in any other country that I visit and when I look at the, the, the public debate on, on, on the issues for which we are responsible, there are a lot of emotions out there uh, that tend to 
govern policies and politics. Uh, and we have been fortunate to have a system whereby that has, has it, of course, it's had an impact on legislation uh, and also on, on, on some very important reform areas. But when it comes to operations, we've been able to stay pretty much clear uh, of all of that, one. And two, we've been able to do it for a very, very long time. So, I mean, these things come and go. Part of, uh, at least in my opinion, part of developments in, in, the, in the area of criminal justice has a tendency of being accident driven. You know, things happen, you react, and then you have all of a sudden a completely new direction. Now, things have happened, a lot of things have happened over the years also in our system, but we as a public service have been able to stick to the ideas that we believe in. You know, we've been able to ride out some of the, some of the emotional storms um, that have been raging you know, outside of, of our service uh, and, and, and kept the, the compass very steady on where we want to go. So that, I think, has been a factor of success and important for our ability to invest our resources where we want to invest them and to stick with the, the ideas and the methodologies that we believe actually work. So that's been important. The second point that I mentioned was, has to do with the way the government has defined our fundamental tasks as a public service. In our multi-annual instruction, it is very clearly stated that our task is twofold. One is to carry out sentences as they are decided by the court system, but also to reduce the risk of recidivism. And the way that's been phrased is very important. The government has not tasked us with reducing recidivism. What they've said is that when you carry out sentences, your job is to reduce the risk of recidivism. You know, there's a, there's a subtle difference there, but it's an important one. And on top of that, the government has explicitly said in our multi-annual instruction that while you do this, you need to do it in a way that is secure, humane, and effective. So carry out the sentences, reduce the risk of recidivism, do it in a secure, humane, and effective way. Those are, you know, the few but, but very important instructions that we receive from the government as to how we are expected to carry out our work. And that in combination with the fact that we have a great deal of uh, freedom in interpreting the how has given us the possibility to develop our strategies. And if, you know, if I should try to explain how that has played out for us, uh, I would say that the, you know, the instruction to do this in a secure way has been fundamentally important uh, because it has, it has made it very clear, I think, to the whole organization that we are expected to be in control of operations. You know, the level of tolerance for any disturbances, any misbehavior, any uh, you know, illegal activities during incarceration, for example, that, that, that level of tolerance is extremely small. Uh, and that means that we've had a very, um, you know, a very sharp focus on our security work uh, over a relatively long period of time. Uh, and, and how has that, you know, how does that materialized? I would point to four things, you know, there, it's more than that, but at least four basic ideas. We call it, you know, we call it dynamic security. I'm sure you have the same kind of terminology for it. But the most important part of our security strategy is, is, uh, is staff inmate relations. You know, that's number one. Um, the second, you know, the second most important part, I think, is, is the a high degree of activation 
of inmates during incarceration. You know, we try to keep people occupied with whatever we can, but structure the day in prisons uh, as much as possible and have as little time to do nothing. That has been a, 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 you know, a fundamental part of keeping control of, of the prison environment. Uh, we have developed over the years a far-reaching uh, and I would say very, very good intelligence organization. Information is everything. Uh, if we don't know what's going on in there, uh, then it becomes extremely difficult to be in control. So we have over the years built up an intelligence organization uh, which is only focusing on, on, on prisons and remand prisons. And it's, it's, uh, it is very, very helpful in, in developing our, our security strategies. And then, of course, we have you know, highly developed you know, technical security measures of all kinds of different uh, sorts. But that's, that's number four. I think the, the three first ones are always more important. Uh, there's always something to be said for the, the walls and the cameras and, and, and the techniques and, 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 and all of that. Um, but it's only part of, of, of the strategy. Now the third one was, you, or the, the, second, the second word is humane. What, what does that mean, you know, to carry out our work in, in a humane manner? Well, if prison staff relations are important in our security strategy, automatically the quality and skills of our staff becomes extremely important. And if you want to be part uh, of our team working with inmates and clients, uh, you have to believe in the potential of people to change. Uh, and this, I, I read an article, I think it was about a week ago in one of our newspapers where one of our female staff was quoted saying, well, the day I stop believing that I can have an impact on the life of my inmates, that's the day I will hand over the keys. Uh, and, and that is an, an extremely important part of, of um, how we develop our strategies. The staff is everything, and their skills uh, uh, means a lot in carrying out whatever strategy we come up with. Um, and another way of, of, I guess, emphasizing that is that if you want to be, if you want to be part of our service, if when we recruit people, um, what we're looking for, you know, we look, at, we look for a, a number of various formal skills, obviously. Uh, but some of the most important things that we're really looking for is values and value systems. You know, if you, if you disrespect people, if you feel that you can't work with anybody, uh, if you can't handle the fact that people have, you know, different sexual orientations or, or come from, from different cultural backgrounds uh, or whatever differences that you meet during the course of your day as a prison officer as well, you know, then you're going to have to find another career path because in our, in our world, you meet everybody. You, we have all kinds of people. And our staff needs to be able to handle that. So that's one part of it. I think the second part of it is to be able to, um, how should I put it, to be able to keep steady. I mean, there are so much provocation uh, in our daily work. You will meet people with so you know, massive problems, uh, control and anger issues, uh, that you need to be able to handle all that. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the, the second most important qualities that we're looking in our staff. And I think the, three, the third one, I might come back to that later, but the, the third one has to do, the third one has to do with um, uh, the ability of uh, our staff to cooperate. Uh, one, I think, of the, the, the key issues in our, in our service is that we are a complex organization. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that for it to function, we need a number of different components to work together. And, and there's a fair amount of research out there that, that uh, supports 
the fact that there is a difference between complex organizations that achieve results and those who have a hard time uh, achieving those results. And the difference is cooperation. You know, organizations that put a lot of emphasis on, 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 on cooperation, uh, and I think in, in the scientific community is called relational coordination. But cooperation is absolutely vital to us. And for that, you need good relations. So that is also going to be a center core in our whole recruitment uh, strategies. We don't need the most skilled people on the labor market in various specialty areas. You know, we're quite happy for them to go to other public services. We need the best people um, to cooperate. So to conclude, uh, has this been, you know, we're happy with the results we're producing. I think that our political, at political level, they're quite happy with what we're doing. Has this been a straight road? Absolutely not. Uh, this has been a process that has been going on for almost 40 years. I think if you ask me what was, what was the turning point, I would say the legislation that was introduced in 1974. So it's taken more than 40 years to build an organization and, and a bureaucratic you know, procedure uh, to do what we're doing today. Uh, have, has there been hiccups? Has there been problems? Yes, massively at many occasions. Uh, it's difficult, you know, the, the, the whole trick for us has been to balance control with rehabilitation and support. And, and that is very difficult. And yes, we have failed many, many times. And, and at times we have invested enormously in rehabilitation and we forgot about security. The result has been a complete chaos in, in our system and the results have been very poor. And at other times we have invested extremely heavily in security regimes, but not in rehabilitation, which means that we've fallen back in terms of finding strategies that actually work for the new generations of inmates and clients that we receive. So there needs to be balance. And yes, our politicians have occasionally and repeatedly forgotten about us and, 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 and put energy, money and resources in other policy areas that have been at times much more important and, and had a higher priority. So that has happened as well. But it really has served us well that we have been able as a service at least to keep focus on the goals and on the results um, and that we've been able to have a, a, a consistent path through these 40 years. And I said initially, Rachel, that I don't give advice, but if you twist my arm and torture me a little bit, I think one of the things that I, I you know, if, if there's one thing that I would, um, that I would point to it's staff and staffing. Yes, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of staff in our prison and remand prisons. That is, that is enormous uh, and it is extremely costly. Uh, yes, we invest in their education and training and we train and retrain our staff both at you know, the basic level and managerial level. Uh, but I guess you know, the conclusion is that Sure, it's very costly, um, but if you don't do it, it's going to cost you more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've written all that out, so it's going to be turned into advice from my number. <laughs> Um, really fascinating. So what we're going to do is um, take some questions. I think I'll probably take two uh, or three at a time and then um, and Nils will answer or any questions you have for me. That's fine. Um, and I think we're aiming to, um, we've got about 25 minutes, half an hour. So put hands up and then well, there'll be a, a um, microphone away to you. I haven't got my glasses today so I'm hoping I can see one here. One person over there. Take two to start with. And can you say who you are briefly? Thank you. Uh, start here, sir. Uh, 
John Plummer. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. C can you tell us a little bit more about the constitutional arrangements the politics are absorbing? A few months ago, the Prison Governors Association, basically their trade union, called for a, quote, independent public inquiry by government into the, quote, unprecedented rise of violent self-harm and suicide in, UK, in their own prisons. Could you tell me how that kind of, it hasn't been announced yet, but nonetheless that was the demand. Could you tell me how that would play out given your relationship between your service and government and department? Hello, good evening. My name's Claudia Sturt. I'm a fellow of the RSA, but also um, a former prison governor and currently director of security and counterterrorism for um, the prison service um, in England and Wales. Can I just thank you very much for an admirably clear exposition of, um, of, of sort of organizational leadership. I think that many practitioners in the room would join me in saying it, you make it sound much simpler than it is. Um, but the, the question that I'd like to ask please is um, when you scan the horizon, what are the new threats and risks that you think you'll be concerned with in five years time that perhaps aren't at the top of your agenda at the moment? <coughs> Uh, on, the, on the constitutional setup, it's really quite simple. Um, the, 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 as I said, the constitution prohibits the gov any individual. The government takes decisions as a, as a collective body, which means that an individual minister cannot instruct me as a director general to do anything. It's the government that has to take a decision. Uh, so that's the first level. Uh, we're, we're still a national agency under the government, uh, so we're absolutely controlled and managed by the government. Uh, but the government has delegated uh, you know, a lot of powers to the civil service. And it's not just this service, of course, it's, it's across the board. Um, one example, you know, in, in, in 20 years ago, the government decided how we were supposed to be organized in detail. You know, how many divisions, how many units, how many people should be in what unit. Now, that's, that's all history. So now it's, it's our responsibility to, to decide, you know, the best organizational setup for running our business, which, which is a huge difference and a very big advantage because it also means that we can shift resources to where we believe it makes the best impact or where it makes a, a, a difference. Um, now, and, and, and the third one is that constitutionally even the government is prohibited from interfering in any matter uh, where we apply the, the law. So we as a civil servant interpret and apply the law and there not even the government as a collective body can have a say. If, they, if they're unhappy with the way things operate they introduce new legislative proposals to the parliament. So that's how the system works. What I forgot to say is that the government hires and fires people like me. So, you know, if, if they're unhappy with the way we run our organizations, um, then they can fire us the same afternoon. Um, challenges. Uh, I think a number of challenges. One is gang violence. Uh, we're seeing a new developing now in, 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 a, in a number of areas throughout the country with a completely new setup of, of criminal gangs. And when I say criminal gangs, and I, I went to one of these areas last week and had a discussion with quite a lot of people, also with some of the, these young, young males as they happen to be in 94% of all the cases, um, they don't have a criminal identity. They don't identify themselves as criminal gangs as opposed to many of the other gangs that we are so used to dealing with since you know, 30, 40 years. They're just friends. Um, but they're extremely close um, structures and they absolutely um, commit criminal offenses massively. Um, 
but it's a completely new dynamic. You know, we're used to working with criminal gangs, but uh, we're going to have to come up with some pretty good ideas on how to reach these individuals. One of the things that, has, that is, is constantly reported back when I meet our staff is that they, they loathe public authorities. They don't want to have anything to do with us. Uh, and that is new. You know, we've always been able to connect with our inmates in, in one way. It's, you know, it's taken a couple of days or weeks or even months to get there, but, but it's never really been a problem. You know, we, we've been there for them. We're not against them. Uh, we've had a, a number of you know, possibilities that we can offer, and sooner or later we've always been able to engage in a dialogue on the future. Now that, that, that's more difficult. So that's one area. Uh, I think a second area is radicalization. Uh, we, had a dis we had a debate, uh, mostly in the media after the Paris bombings, where you know, we were immediately exposed as incubators of, of radicalization. And, and uh, you know, that, that upset us uh, quite a bit, because we certainly don't share that view. Uh, what's out there is in here. So whether we have a radicalization process in society, of course we will have that in the prison environment as well. Uh, but you have to keep a little bit you know, separate what is, what is effect and, and, and what is the cause. Uh, having said that, I think we will be receiving an increasing number of individuals with, with that kind of value system. Uh, we have a lot of young uh, people who travel mostly from the area of Gothenburg down to Syria, and they come back with, with some pretty terrible experiences. Uh, and they will commit criminal offenses, they will be apprehended, they will be convicted, and they will be in our care. Uh, they're very young, mostly, so they will be with us for a very short period of time. And we're going to, again, have to come up with some methodology of, of reaching them and, and, and planting that little seed of, of doubt in their heads uh, in order to, to get a change. One of the things we had this discussion earlier, one thing that completely fascinated me is you talking about the extent to which that would involve engaging staff with history, with the context of those, those new challenges. Um, I didn't know if you could say it, but I was, I was sort of quite fascinated by... No, no, but again, when I, when I meet our staff and, and discuss these things, you know, the one thing that they keep saying is that we need training. Give us training. Uh, we know they're coming. Some of them are already here. Um, we need some kind of tool uh, to meet them in a dialogue, and, 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 and it's difficult. Uh, so what we're looking now to do, and, and I think we might try to do this uh, together with the police organization, is to develop some basic training concept uh, which probably doesn't have very much to do with religion and, and the religious language that is used and the religious symbols and all of that, but more the geopolitical context. What, what are these <coughs> conflicts about? Where are they and, um, and what are they about? What is the dynamics of the forces of the, the, the various parties in these conflicts? What do they want? Uh, and how are the power structures set up? What is the economy of this? So at least there is a deeper understanding amongst our staff on at least where to begin a dialogue on, on the various issues that, are, that, that preoccupy their minds. I'm going to take two more, one from this side. No, one um, in the middle. I'll take those two, in fact, in the middle. There you go. Hi, I'm uh, Nathan Dick from Clinks. We're a membership body that supports voluntary sector charities that work in this sector. Um, you mentioned collaboration and probably in a different context, but I wondered what your experience had been between collaboration from charities, NGOs, community groups within both your prison and probation serve, to make more aptly probation, or prison, sorry, for today. Um, I think we've had various attempts at that collaboration and some have succeeded and some have failed, so it would just be really interesting to see what your experience had been. Hey. Yeah, man in front of him. Hi, uh, my name is Vishal Nair from a company called Buddy. 
Um, my question really was to do with uh, the fact that your organization is actually the Swedish probation, Prisons and Probation Service. So it essentially captures the journey of the person through prison all the way out to society in a different way to the UK. Um, so how important is that? And the second point around that journey is that recently um, SPVS uh, issued an RFI for new technology to assist with that journey. So again, how important do you feel that would be um, for the future? I didn't say much about the, you know, the third of the three words I mentioned, and that is efficiency. Uh, um, one of the things I think that has been crucial for us is that when, when, we, when we reflect on how to carry out our work in an efficient way, one of the things that we do is we work extensively with non-governmental organizations. Uh, it's, it's quite clear that there are so many, there are so many other parties out there uh, that are engaged uh, and that have developed various kinds of, of, of techniques and activities for these groups of, of individuals. So we really do try to hook up with them um, and, and, and allow them to you know, do work within our system, um, but also encourage and, and facilitate for them to continue what they do. Uh, both before and after uh, a, a, a criminal justice sentence. One of the reasons I was in, in one of these areas the other week was that there is a very interesting organization in that particular part of Stockholm. Uh, and it was quite clear when we were discussing that, you know, first of all, they know, they know all of these young individuals on a first name basis. They know who they are. They live there. They work with them long before you know, they are reprehended for the, the crimes that they commit. Then they lose sight of them during the time that they're with us. And then they have to pick up again when they come back. So one of the ambitions that we have is to link up a little bit more with, with the non-governmental sector and the civil society and, and allow also them to be in contact with these individuals throughout their, their journey in, in, in our system. Now efficiency, I'm coming to your question, is also has to do with who does what in the service. We have three or actually four different parts. It's the remand prison and what we do there uh, is the prisons and the probation. Now what, what we're doing now is that we're changing a little bit the roles uh, because one of the problems that we've had is that it's been three very separate parts of the organization. Uh, and in fact, it's the same individuals that travel through the system. So now what we've done is that we have put the probation officers in charge of the entire planning process. So all programming and all planning is handled by probation, which means that the probation organization comes into play already in the remand prisons and start figuring out what the problem is and, and, and what we can possibly do in order to help and support. Uh, and that, that, you know, we haven't evaluated that yet. It's relatively recent. We've, done, we've started doing that a couple of years ago. Uh, but we're, we're already seeing a very positive effect when the clients reach parole. Um, because in our system, we, you know, we will continue to work with them in probation for at least a year. Uh, on parole, and, and in the old days, you know, they felt that, okay, I'm done with it. You know, when they arrive at, at, at the, pro pro the probation officer will have to, you know, work up some energy in order to continue work. Now that is functioning much better, you know, from day one, it's clear that this is your sentence, and this is what's going to happen, you know, today, tomorrow, in a month's time, next year, and in four years. Uh, and what the probation service does is, is to do that backwards. So if you have a, a three or four year sentence, the question is, where do you want to be in four years time? And then the first task is to make sure that the client takes ownership of that plan. So it's not our plan. You know, it's not the plan of, of, of a civil servant imposed on the client. It's our plan. 
So, the, you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into figuring out what the problems are and what we can offer in terms of programming or treatment during the time that is at our disposal. And that makes a big difference when that individual reaches the time of, of probation and, and parole, because then we can work much more concentrated on finishing what, uh, what we started in, 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 in prison. Right, it's time for a few more. So, any other sec one at the back, please. And another one at the back. And then um, Laura there with glasses. <laughs> So I can take too much. There was one. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, there. Yeah. Bodil Isaacson from Unlock Graduates. You mentioned a little bit at the end about your how important training for your staff was. Um, I wonder if you could go into a bit more detail about what your initial training looks like and where it focuses. The, the training. Yeah. And then there's one more. We're taking three this time. Laura O'Brien. Hi, Mum. Um, I, <laughs> sorry, I had to, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I am a cr criminal defence solicitor, and um, I know that Rachel will agree with me. It feels like in the criminal justice system in general in this country that the, one of the biggest challenges is overcoming um, the views of the public in terms of the system, its objectives, and why it's something to invest in, and it feels that that public problem is linked um, to getting the funding into the system and I wonder you've spoken a lot about the internal workings and the political structure whether that is something that you've had to overcome in Sweden and if so how did you do it okay. um, I think the estimate is that we have approximately 30 to 35 percent of our inmate and client population with some kind of uh, mental health issue. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big issue also in, in, in our country. Um, how do we manage it? We're, we're, trying, we're trying very hard to link up with the healthcare system. Uh, I think if, if there's one conclusion that we have drawn is that the better we manage in operating the health issues together with the healthcare authorities. And we have a principle of normality in our country, which means that we don't have our own healthcare organization within the prison system. We have doctors and we have nurses and all of that, but, but the basic responsibility for healthcare uh, also during incarceration belongs to the healthcare, healthcare services and not to the prison service. So I think the key is to make that, that cooperation function. Is it functioning well? Not well enough, in our opinion. Uh, there are some real organizational issues. We are one national governmental organization. We're, we're a state-run organization. We're, 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 we're everywhere in the, in the entire country. The healthcare services are run at a regional level. So they are 21 different independent organizations. And, and that's where the problem starts. Uh, so, you know, we're putting a lot of resources into coordinating with the healthcare services. Uh, no, we don't think that it's operating as smoothly as we would like. Uh, it presents us with a number of, you know, very serious ethical issues because some of these uh, some, some of these mental issues are, you know, it's the relatively, uh, the, you know, the relatively easy to address. You know, it's not rocket science. They, they, they need support and they need help. We can do some of that ourselves while they are with us. 
But the question that we're often faced with is, is it, eth is, is it ethically um, defendable to start something if we don't know that it will be continued and fulfilled? <coughs> and the answer at times is no. You know, it's better not to do anything. And you might even, you, know, you might even do damage if you start a, a, a treatment or, or a program uh, and then you don't complete it. So th there are a lot of things to be done, I think, in our system in order to make the, 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 the treatment process seamless uh, throughout an, an, an incarceration. Training of, st of staff, uh, very important. Uh, we don't have a you know, an extremely long training period. Uh, it's 20 weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, no, it was longer, uh, only a couple of years ago, we had to cut it down for, for budgetary reasons. Um, now we're, we're making some changes again in order to, to uh, upgrade it a little bit. One of the things that we're doing is that we're uh, you know, we're, we're trying to design our training uh, in a way that it prepares our staff for the first day at work, not for the last day at work. Uh, so focus on getting the job done, you know, done the first day um, out there. And then we can continue with a number of additional training programs, specialization, uh, or, 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 or qualifications for a number of, of, of various, uh, you know, functions. Uh, but it's important to provide the staff with the basic skills they need to do the job. I think one of the more interesting things that we have developed over the last couple of years is a program where we gather a number of staff, it's all voluntary, uh, uh, young people, beginners, but also those who have been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, and then they meet for, I think it's six or seven or eight times in the course of a, a, a couple of weeks, and just exchange experiences. Uh, and it's been extremely popular. It has allowed them to a little bit, you know, reset their minds around what they do and why they're there. It's enormously beneficial for the, for the newcomers and the young people, uh, you know, to listen to the more experienced staff telling stories, telling stories about, you know, the success stories, what worked and, 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 and what did not work. So that's been very, very important. Secondly, we, we're trying to invest, as we're, 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 the, first, four, we're the fourth largest state-run organization in the country, uh, which means that we have a lot of staff obviously, uh, but we also have a lot of managers. And one of the things that, that we're prioritizing is the first level management level. You know, with all, all respect to governors and, and all the other people, they are pretty expendable. Uh, <laughs> but the first level managers are absolutely crucial. You know, if they are on board and they function well, then you're home. Uh, so there we try to invest more in terms of training now, um, both uh, aimed at those who want to be managers, you know, who put up their hands and says, I want to apply for one of those positions. Good, come here, we'll train you. Uh, and secondly, those who are already first-line managers uh, and try to provide them with, you know, more sets of skills in, in various areas. So we have, we've developed that, and, and, and again, we haven't evaluated the effect of that yet. It's relatively new, uh, but it's popular, it's appreciated, and, and I think it will have an effect. Uh, what was the third question? The public. Oh, the public, the most difficult one, thank you. <laughs> no, we have the same public debate as, as, as everywhere else. Um, um, you know, tough on crimes, l longer sentences, uh, serious crime, all of that. Um, I think our strategy is we try to focus on the other end of the problem. Uh, you know, while, while much of the public debate focuses on what we do with serious crime and, and, and long sentences and, and making them even longer, 
What, what we've tried to do is, is to, you know, because we're constantly asked our opinion on that, and, and I usually say that I don't have an opinion on that. You know, that's, that's politics. If, if the political system wants longer sentences for serious crime, you know, go ahead. That's not our issue. What, what we try to do is to point at the other end of the scale, and we say we have a fairly well-developed system for, uh, you know, non-custodial sentences, uh, and it's underused. And we know we have a problem. We have about 80% of our prison sentences are shorter than a year or shorter. Almost 70% of all the prison sentences are six months or shorter, which means that, you know, it's a bit of a paradox because we have a relatively high level of ambition when it comes to, you know, doing good things while people are with us. But the time for that has shrunk to weeks and months. So that has been our strategy. We say, okay, fine, if you want longer sentences, go ahead. But we have another problem here, which is that we're, we're, we're sentencing so many people to extremely short prison sentences, and we really don't know how, you know, how to offer meaningful activities during that time. But we do have a probation system which offers much you know, longer and much more intrusive possibilities of actually you know, doing some things in terms of programming and treatment. So why aren't we using that even more? And that's mostly a discussion we're having with the courts, not with the political system, uh, because it's, it's partly a, 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 you know, a question of how the courts are choosing between a prison sentence or a probational uh, sanction. At the time, and we are we are out of time. Um, thank you for fantastic questions. I'm sorry about the nepotism, but what can you do? Um, and I will say thank you to Nils properly in a minute. But I wanted to, to just quickly raise um, the RSA is currently we're just about uh, we're just embarked on a piece of work developing a new network. We won't run it, but we will design it that's going to try and support governors in in this new landscape. So looking at uh, those, those leadership issues, how they add capacity. Some of you have already uh, filled in the survey that we're doing. We need your views, your opinions, because the whole thing is going to be about engaging others and what that should look like and how it should work. So if you haven't done it already and you fancy it, go onto the RSA website and punch a new futures network and you'll get there. I'd be really grateful. Uh, and then finally, finally, can you all join me to thank Niels for what I think has been fascinating and, and brilliant. Thank you.